um, adolescent researchers, but specifically in terms of um, approaching the study of adolescence from a perspective that's um, not the traditional psychology that 97% of um, adolescent researchers unfortunately are. Um, Alice is uh, a truly a legend in the field, and I think easily, since you brought your copy, I, I was going to bring my copy and I forgot it today. Oh no, <laughs> I went through it already. Alice um, wrote this book a few years ago called Adolescence and Anthropological Inquiry. And this is truly one of the, like, one of the classic works in adolescence research, and it's um, easily the most definitive and well-known um, work from the perspective of anthropology. So Alice has been continuously pushing the disciplinary boundaries of how we think about adolescence. And I'm excited about your talk today and that you're going to integrate self-regulation, which is primarily an internal kind of psychological construct with more of a cross-cultural perspective. So very eager to hear about that. And with that, I'm going to shut up and start, <laughs> to start hearing about it. <laughs> that later. I just wanted to get it on the board before I started talking. Um, and if you can't see it, that's okay because I'll, I'll go over those points. Um, yeah, and um, as we just heard, the self-regulation is an internal process. It's internalized self-control. And I think it's important to understand that that self con um, that's, um, self regulation differs from self-monitoring. At least in my view, self-monitoring is when you're consciously or barely consciously uh, avoiding punishment, uh, as in a dictatorship, or as your your dog will will not jump on the sofa because it knows that if it does, it'll get punished. You know, you don't have to uh, remind it every time not to jump on the sofa. So I think a, a lot of a lot of uh, higher animals. Uh, do self-monitoring, but self-regulation, the internalized self-regulation, may be unique to humans. We're not, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, it's a, it, it involves a fairly developed cognitive uh, uh, sophistication. Uh, self-regulation involves behaving in ways that have positive outcomes and avoiding behavior that can have harmful consequences unless the gain outweighs the cost. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about risky behavior because um, uh, risky behavior is sometimes counterpoised to self-regulation. But I, that's not necessarily uh, accurate as I think I'm going to talk about. And, and I'll show you within cultural contexts context, how both risky behavior and self-regulation and absence of self-regulation can be culturally um, uh, influenced. Um, it also involves planning for the future in that future outcomes depend on present behavior. Self-regulation requires the motivation to control impulses by understanding which impulses should be inhibited, which impulses should be allowed free play, and the conditions under wi which uh, either choice is appropriate. Um, Self-regulation should not be conflated with avoiding risk taking. Um, risky play as a means of gaining confidence through meeting challenges is a normal part of, uh, of children's development. And in adolescence, the motivation to take risks is even stronger when novelty seeking increases. And this is, of course, for both sexes. It starts earlier in life, I think there's a kind of a kick in this uh, at around adrenarchy, around age seven or so, uh, when children begin to seek novelty in, uh, certainly in, in emotional um, uh, relations with other people other than the old familiar uh, ones. And then uh, certainly uh, this uh, novelty seeking increases at adolescence. And this probably goes back to our um, uh, primate heritage because certainly um, uh, at sexual maturity, at or around sexual maturity, in uh, monkeys and apes, one sex or the other, or sometimes both, will leave the natal nest or, or, or troop or uh, the home base, whatever it is, and go out taking risks on route, will 
go out to seek a mate. So uh, taking risks for gain is, of course, part of our, of our uh, evolved heritage. Uh, Male-male competition fueled by testosterone increases markedly as boys compete for the attention of girls and seek social dominance as a way to impress them. This does not have to lead to dangerous behavior, however, as attractiveness uh, to girls and social dominance can be attained by other ways, such as mastery of social or other skills, if the environment makes that possible. And this is, of course, captured in the battle cry, Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> Even when highly risky behavior seems to be impulsive, as in many, but possibly not all, persons who follow a fast life history strategy, that is, um, uh, undertake dangerous activities uh, and uh, uh, get involved early in life in sexual activity reproduci reproduction. Um, uh, I'm not convinced that all, all individuals who, who, who uh, follow a faster life history necessarily do this uh, uh, impulsively, but um, uh, we do know that many do, and, Br and Bruce Ellis and his colleagues, of course, have written uh, extensively about this, and um, their conclusion is that uh, risky behavior may be the best or only way to social and reproductive success, I meaning uh, better something than nothing. While individually adaptive, uh, these strategies can have severe social consequences causing harm to others, not least the offspring of those individuals who follow a fast life history strategy. There's considerable individual variation in risk taking, even within similar environments. Some of this undoubtedly has a genetic base, such as individual differences in the serotonin, serotonin transporter gene and dopamine D4 receptor, as Belsky and Plus uh, 2009 uh, discussed. And this indicates evolved plasticity for this particular feature. Other within environmental variation may be epigenetic uh, due to differences uh, starting uh, at conception or perhaps even before if, if uh, parental behavior such as diet uh, affects the uh, development of um, uh, due to uh, differences in early childhood experience that result in differences in rural substrates of perception and cognition, and here I refer to Hahn and Orpheus, 2008. It is important to separate impulsive risk-taking done without thought of the longer-term consequences from strategic risk-taking. Um, the strategic risk-taker may be in danger such as the test pilot or the professional soldier, but he or she weighs the consequences. This also takes a fair amount of cognitive competence, which differs among individuals and also uh, by the maturity of the brain. So uh, brain, there's been a lot of talk lately about how adolescents have immature brains, and that's what, uh, one reason anyway why they engage in more risky behavior. Well, that undoubtedly is, is a fact. In addition to genetic and epigenetic factors, the social setting can reinforce or militate against the self-regulation of adolescents. We know that social pressure exerted within groups of peers can persuade even the risk averse to commit dangerous acts. An emotional contagion, a feature of many social species, can override inhibitions in groups of humans. Social influence can have positive effects, of course, when the leaders reward pro-social behavior or self-regulated behavior. The kind of self-regulation employed, therefore, is likely to differ, to differ according to the social setting. A cross-cultural study by Schlegel and Barry uh, of adolescent socialization uh, using a sample of 186 tribal and traditional societies coded, and here this is uh, I'll, I'll unpack the sentence. I coded the cultural expectation that some adolescents would behave in impulsive, antisocial ways. Now, uh, what I mean by that is that we did not have statistical data 
So we could not say that uh, uh, adolescents in culture A uh, misbehave more or engage in impulsive behavior more than adolescents in culture B, because we didn't have that kind of data. But we did have um, the expectation that adolescents, some adolescents anyway, will misbehave, as I think we do in our culture. I mean, um, and this is an old tradition, you know, boys will be boys, kind of, kind of uh, taking it for granted that some adolescents will misbehave some of the time. And of course, most parents hope it's not their kids, but, but anyway, some, somebody's children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> else's children, not mine. Okay, so we coded the cultural expectation that some adolescents would behave in impulsive antisocial ways, which turned out to be mainly fighting and theft. Uh, the finding was that in cultures where adolescent boys spent less time with adult men, um, that is, below the mean on an ordinal scale, some boys were expected to misbehave, although most people did not want their sons to do so, and the, and the, the number of cultures for which we had information was 42, and, and P was less than 0 0.014. For girls, there was too little variance in time spent with women. That is, girls spent most of their time in the company of women, whether or not other adolescent girls were present, uh, so that we, we could not measure an association. Uh, from this, we can draw the conclusion that self-regulation is advanced by incorporating adolescents into adult-based settings, which become training grounds for self-regulation. That is, of course, assuming that the adults themselves are self-regulated <laughs> and not impulsive. You know, uh, I shall return to this point later. Okay, now let's talk about cultural factors in adolescent self-regulation. So far, I've talked about uh, intracultural or intra-environmental uh, features, genetic and epigenetic, which are by individual, and uh, oh, and I'll come to these. Uh, gen I talked a bit about setting, with or without, uh, uh, in the presence of adults, uh, a good deal of the time versus not. Uh, I'll talk about gender and social class a little bit later. Uh, cultures provide models for emotions and behavior appropriate to the situation. Um, in earlier times, I think anthropologists were um, more behavioristic and talked about models of and for behavior, but we have to consider emotions too, because after all, what motivates behavior? Uh, uh, we have to always consider the emotional factor, and some uh, emotions are appropriate uh, culturally defined as appropriate, others are defined as inappropriate and have to be suppressed or ignored. And uh, under what conditions do you uh, express or suppress uh, various emotions? Okay, so we're talking about both emotions and behavior here. Um, culture provides the rules and the norms and when these should be relaxed or broken. In other words, we always we all have rules, and then we have rules for breaking the rules. I mean, how do you break the rules appropriately? <laughs> the most obvious example of approved role breaking um, is the Carnival of Roman Catholic Europe, when the lords of misrule reign, but such times of license permitting gluttony, drunkenness, sexual license, or hallucinogenic states are widely observed and much enjoyed across cultures. So these are times when self-regulation is culturally relaxed. I mean, it's culturally proved that you relax your self-regulation during these periods of time. And probably, uh, since this is so extremely widespread, and, and one could almost say universal, although I hesitate to, to do that because I haven't looked at enough data to make that generalization, but it's probably universal that we need these breaks from self-regulation. Uh, in our daily lives, a lot of that happens just through fantasy or, or uh, 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 what, you know, there, there are plenty of opportunities for uh, relaxing self-regulation, but cultures also have these times when the relaxation of self-regulation is appropriate. 
Um, I shall speak later about the encouragement in some cultures of adolescent self-deregulation as a cultural strategy. I mean, there are, there are um, cultures that actually encourage adolescents to behave in an unself-regulated way for specific purposes, that is, the purposes of the adults, not necessarily the kids themselves. Um, and we'll look we'll into those cases. Since people everywhere recognize that adolescents are more than children but less than full social adults, every culture has conventional ways of treating them and expecting them to behave. People take pleasure in the beauty and charm of adolescents and often find humor in their social awkwardness. They get annoyed at adolescents' recalcitrance, particularly parents get annoyed at adolescents' recalcitrance in, their de in the kids' desire to establish their individuality and find them harder to manage than younger children. In fact, many cultures have means for getting adolescents, especially boys, out of the house and letting others deal with them. I see some knowing looks. <laughs> Anybody who's had ad adolescent sons, and those of you who have been adolescent sons, <laughs> probably. My, my 16 year old son's right now working in a gorilla lab. You think of child fosterage or teenage fosterage, which is uh, uh, quite widespread in many cultures. Uh, in, in European societies, kids whose labor was absolutely not needed at home were sent off to work for, for neighbors or for, for relatives. Um, uh, the, the aristocracy sent their boys, not their girls, but sent their boys off at quite a young age, sometimes as young as seven or eight, uh, into the homes of other nobles. The, the, uh, the, uh, the belief being that they would be stricter than the parents, in other words, mother wouldn't spoil uh, the boy. Um, boys in, in a number of cultures sleep away from the home, and the, the rationale for this is that uh, they should not be uh, observing parents' sexual behavior, but somehow that isn't that seem, thought it was necessary for girls. I mean, girls are. Um, uh, not not pushed out to the degree that boys are. Uh, boys' dormitories are very uh, common. Some some cultures actually have dormitories for both sexes, but uh, it's much more common to have dormitories for boys. I know in the Hopi, uh, by the time a boy became an adolescent, Hopi Indians, where I did my initial field work, um, by the time he became a teenager, a boy in the summertime, the boys would sleep on the roofs of the houses. Sometimes other people would too, but the boys would congregate as a group and sleep on somebody's roof. Uh, and in the cooler weather, cold weather, uh, they would join other unmated males, uh, men of different ages, widowers, uh, bachelors, whatever, uh, and sleep in the kivas, these sort of ceremonial buildings that act as men's houses. So this idea of getting adolescent boys away from away from their parents and out of the house and letting others <coughs> discipline them is not uncommon. And I think that probably it can be a great relief sometimes for the parents. <laughs> While self-regulation is an individual process, it develops within social settings and a cultural context. Uh, through social interactions and communications, we learn which emotions and behaviors are approved or disapproved and under what circumstances. We also learn which goals are appropriate and what actions should be taken to achieve them. Among other cultural practices, socialization techniques, whether explicitly or implicitly, inculcate the values that define culturally appropriate behavior. Now I'd like to talk about the cultural management of adolescent self-regulation. Um, how do cultures uh, deal with um, their developing children. More than adults and younger children, adolescents are responding to actors of two different age sets, adults and peers. Both age sets are important for their present and future well-being. Adults control the, the resources that adolescents need at the present time and will need in the future. Peers of the same sex are the ones with whom they form alliances 
and with whom they are beginning to compete for resources and for the attention of potential sexual partners. When they become adults, their adolescent peers will be adult peers. In addition to the alliances and competitions already present in adolescence, their relationships will take on new form, forms when they form economic partnerships and marry one another's siblings. Adults usually expect or hope that adolescents will be responsible and cooperative and use their judgment by staying out of potentially dangerous situations unless, unless these are uh, seen as necessary situations. Uh, although impulsive or destructive behavior may be tolerated or, in, or encouraged, now I will come back to that. It is to adolescents' advantage to comply, at least in the presence of adults, because compliance is more likely to convince adults to give them access to the resources they need. In small-scale societies where people know each other over, um, over their lifetimes, reputations earned early on uh, are carried for many years. I knew an old Hopi Indian man whose nickname is a clumsy and unattractive boy, Chukka, which means mud, was still whispered many years later. Uh, impulsive behavior is more, more tolerated among peers. They often admire risky behavior and challenge each other for status within the peer group by taking risks. Risk taking is more common for boys in all cultures. Its origin uh, probably, its origin probably lies in male-male competition for access to females, which characterizes almost all species of mammals. Girls, of course, also compete for social dominance, similar to females of other species, but at least in traditional societies, their risky behavior rarely takes forms that endanger them physically, although that too uh, is variable. Um, I'd like to talk about cultural expectations. Uh, the general cultural definition of adolescence defines the expectations that adults have of adolescence and that adolescents have of one another. If adolescence is defined as a period of freedom from responsibility, they will act accordingly. If, however, life becomes more confined and responsibilities are increased, they will take them on, not always without protest. For traditional Hopis, for example, adolescent boys had the freedom to roam the, villages, the village after the day's work was done. When they married, they moved into their wives' homes, and the Hopis, especially uh, mothers, indulged sons who would soon face the authority and discipline of their father and mother-in-law. In other words, you had this, this stereotype, which is often is from my observation, of uh, 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 relatively irresponsible. I say relatively because these boys, these, uh, traditionally these boys had to work in the fields with their fathers or uncles, uh, but in their free time they were relatively irresponsible, roamed around in packs and um, uh, uh, spent a lot of time away from the village, um, sometimes getting into trouble, sometimes not. Um, and tended to be indulged by their mothers. The, the, the uh, excuse being that uh, only too soon my son will become a husband in somebody else in his wife's home, and his mother-in-law and his father-in-law will uh, discipline him, which is true. Mm -hmm. At the same time, their sisters were now pretty much confined to the homes their homes and the homes of kin and, or close neighbors for intensive training in industriousness and service of the clan. They were carefully monitored by their mothers, helped by younger siblings who would report on their older sisters. Uh, the tattletale younger brother or sister uh, <laughs> very common. Adolescence was a happy time for boys were reluctant to marry and become responsible and often young, burdened young adults. It was not so for girls for whom marriage and adulthood were a release and brought freedoms from many restrictions. And um, in interviewing one very old couple, uh, they were talking about the early days of their marriage and uh, she told me, uh, she was doing the narrating, and she said, you know, uh, when we first got married, he moved in, and then after a few days he went back home. 
and after a couple of weeks he came back, and stayed a few days, and then he went home again. And finally his father brought him, we were all sitting at dinner one night, and his father brought him over and said, in front of us, here, you stay here. This is your home now. <laughs> and the comment on this was, and meanwhile her husband was sitting there nodding and kind of smiling. Her comment was, it takes a while for young husbands to get adjusted. And so it was quite a, quite a, quite a change from the freedom and, and, and relative irresponsibility, relative at a, a low level of self-regulation on the adolescent boys. Um, expectations of self-regulation may be defined differently depending on sex of an adolescent, as the Hopi example shows. In those cultures that value virginity at marriage, which the Hopi did not, the burden of self-regulation in sexual matters falls most heavily on girls. We should note that the actual restriction falls about equally on both sexes, because adolescent boys in such cultures rarely have access to adult female sexual access. They, they don't have sexual access to their age mates, and they don't have sexual access to adult females. They're just as restricted in heterosexual activity as the girls are. Nevertheless, boys are not necessarily punished for trying to seduce girls, but girls are punished very often very severely if they succumb. <coughs> Although it seems paradoxical, there is self-regulation of dangerous risk-taking, or what I call strategic risk-taking, when risks in putting oneself in danger is a major means to future success. And I'm not talking about impulsive risk-taking, the fast life history strategy, strategy but uh, taking risks with full awareness of what the risk is and kind of doing a cost, uh, a sort of a cost-benefit analysis. This is generally true in pastoral societies where success is especially unpredictable where herds are vulnerable to disease, drought, and raiding. Theft of animals is endemic as a culturally accepted means of augmenting one's herd. Adolescent boys are encouraged to try to steal animals to help build up their herds so long as the victims are not likely to take revenge. Uh, sometimes there are uh, approved uh, relatives for whom you may uh, steal an animal as kind of a practice theft. Uh, <laughs> like your mother's brother, your maternal uncle, or your grandfather, or somebody. Uh, if you can get away with it, uh, 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 you can steal an animal and, and uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be more or less praised by, certainly by your peers and your parents uh, won't say anything and then the, the person from whom you've stolen the animal is not supposed to um, uh, defense. Uh, so there is actually training here for risk taking. Of course when you become an adult uh, the risk taking is much greater because uh, death or disability could be a result. Or you could lose all, lose all your herds, all your animals. Boys in pastoral societies in Central Asia and Africa and the horse herding tribes of the American Great Plains all encourage boys to take risks and court danger in preparation for raiding in young adulthood. Fighting, at least away from the home settlement, was tolerated as it had prepared them for later combat when raiding for animals or defending their herds. So uh, whatever emotions are elicited in fights, and I would think whatever impulses uh, are, are set free uh, in fights or motivate fights can certainly be expressed freely um, under these conditions. Strategic, risky, and dangerous behavior is culturally approved, and adolescents are socialized for it. And here there's a certain ambiguity, because you can do this. You can, you can behave in an antisocial way as long as it's not either people who are likely to take revenge, uh, not powerful enough to perhaps to take revenge, or people with whom the adults want to maintain good relationships. And here it becomes uh, sort of quite ambiguous, or ambivalent, I should say, because um, uh, adolescents, well, I'll come to this point again later, adolescents are sometimes encouraged to do things that, uh, if done by an adult, would cause real trouble. But
but if done by an adolescent, the parents, if discovered, say, the parents can apologize and say, well, they're only kids, you know, that's how, that's how kids behave. So uh, there are certain, there's certain license given to adolescents under some conditions to behave in these unregulated uh, ways. Um, and I might add, as a kind of aside, because I don't want to leave girls out completely, uh, girl, adolescent girls are also taught how to act in risky situations when risk taking is required, say by, for example, remote subsistence. Plains Indian girls and young women went foraging in small groups away from the camp where they were unprotected and vulnerable to abduction or rape by members of hostile bands or just opportunistic strangers. They were trained how to use the knives they carried as foraging tools in self-defense. These were, these were strong, confident young women and girls who, who had to know how to defend themselves uh, against any dangerous wild animals, although they'd be more endangered by you know, some uh, enemy or stranger than they would uh, by the plains by, by, by an animal. There aren't too many really dangerous predators out on the plains, at least not, not during the daytime. Um, in at least two very different parts of Eurasia, women learned how to use long sleeves containing rocks as weapons. And I've seen uh, pictures of these things. The, the coat has a very long sleeve that's kind of a pocket, and uh, uh, that pocket could be used for carrying, it could be used as a kind of a handbag or purse, but it could also contain a rock. And <laughs> in the Tang Dynasty China, women studied trader, traders and workers whose occupations took them from the shelter of their homes and neighborhoods had to defend themselves against thieves and ruffians. And in medieval Germany, a woman whose reputation had been sullied by a man might be given the chance to defend it and take revenge in combat with her armed but stationary slanderer. In other words, he beat, he beat. Let's see, kind of he, in, in a kind of a pit. He couldn't move out of the pit, and she had this this weapon, and he was he could uh, if he was quick enough, he could uh, somehow uh, uh, defend himself against that weapon. I'm not quite sure how it was done, but but she at least had the chance to actually engage in physical combat with somebody who slandered her. There's, uh, there's a, a uh, museum of medieval crime, or some, some such title like that, in Nuremberg, Germany, that has books dating from the 16th century, and um, 16th and 17th, 16th century, and earlier even, that show illustrations of these various, of these various, um, punishments that people uh, uh, could expect for certain crimes. And this, I was very struck by the illustration of this woman uh, dressed in what looked almost like a, uh, a taekwondo suit or a you know, karate suit uh, with this, this, this sleeve. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, strategic risk taking and the relaxation of self regulation also characterizes cultures of honor. Those societies where men, especially, are expected to be on guard to perceive insults and quick to avenge them. Many of these societies exist in, or their cultures had their origins in pastoral regions or other regions where, one, where might makes right and strength of character, at least in younger men, is measured by a willingness to fight in defense of one's honor and that of one's family. The Balkans, North Africa, and Western Spain are among those regions. A well-known study of perception of insult and reaction to it by Nisbet and Cohen, Six, compared young men from the north and south of the United States as to their aggressiveness in response to perceived insult. As one could have predicted from other works, such as Fisher's historical study of Albion's seed, which talked about the, the various uh, 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 
migration streams from Great Britain, from the British Isles that settled in different parts of the eastern U.S. and brought their cultures with them, uh, the southern youths perceived insult more readily and reacted more aggressively than their northern peers, even though they were not more aggressive in general. The cultural mores of the south, except for a narrow coastal belt, derived from early settlers from regions of the British Isles that were generally lawless and which also depended heavily on pastoralism. The mores of the north derived from early settlers from southern England, where litigation rather than uh, physical aggression was used to settle questions of insult. And I read uh, that uh, uh, New England uh, was ex an extremely lit litigious uh, uh, society, New, New England culture in, in the 17th and early 18th centuries uh, was, uh, was highly litigious. Nisbet and Cohen believe that these southern mores were perpetuated by child training techniques that existed at least up to the time of their study. While there are general cultural expectations of adolescence and socialization that encourages these to be met, specific expectations and social, socialization practices are not necessarily uniform within a society. They differ to some degree by gender, as we have seen. In more complex societies, rank or social class considerations <coughs> create different socialization milieus. In Samoa, for example, where social rank was a determinant of behavior, daughters of high-ranked families were expected to remain virgins, while ordinary girls had sexual freedom that did not require the same degree of self-regulation in sexual matters. These were the lusty girls, so beloved of 19th century American sailors. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote about, you know, the Samoan, uh, Samoan girls. The high-ranking taupu, or girl from an elite family, was another matter because her children inherited rank from both parents, and there could be no, no possibility of a lower-ranking boy making a paternity claim on the daughter of the taupu. The same distinction between high rank and ordinary girls was true for Omaha Indians. Very interesting. Uh, differences in birth order can also result in differences in cultural expectations of self-regulation with different socialization practices to fit these different expectations. This is most obvious in cultures and societies with the cultural practice of primogeniture, where family property is passed through oldest sons unless there are no sons. In such societies, old and older, oldest sons receive greater training for self-regulation as they prepare to take over responsibilities from their father for managing the estate or the status. Younger sons, who may have to fend for themselves, have to be prepared to take risks, even uh, dangerous ones. The Polynesians who set out to sea in search of unknown islands to settle were not those who stood to inherit at home, for younger sons throughout European history, combat in the homeland and later in the colonies was the most risky way to win fame and reward, but also had the greatest payoff. So here we could think of, uh, in this case, we can think of uh, more of strategic risk taking, but still um, there has to be, uh, you know, if, if you're put in a dangerous situation, there, uh, uh, you don't just enter that dangerous situation calmly and coolly and rationally, uh, there, there, has, has, there is an emotional component that goes in with that. Uh, when, where ultimogeniture, that is inherit, inheritance by the youngest is practiced, it is the older sons who must be prepared to take possibly dangerous risks. And it's the youngest son who is uh, most heavily trained for self-regulation. Um, and here, uh, uh, this is this is this is quite interesting. Uh, um, the subsistence mode of a culture is also related to the degree of tightness or looseness of self-regulation. I spoke about pastoral societies um, allowing for relaxation and self-regulation under certain conditions. In fact, uh, requiring it. One could say the same thing about foragers. Uh, foragers uh, also have to be prepared to 
uh, face um, uh, risky situations. There may be combat, they may um, uh, they have very fluid societies, and uh, the self-regulation is not as severe as it is, say, in agricultural societies, where obedience is a major theme of adolescent socialization, child and adolescent socialization. So, so uh, the degree to which people are expected to uh, obey, to control themselves, to uh, uh, think, to think strategically, um, and and uh, uh, be aware constantly of of how their behavior is going to affect uh, other people. Uh, these kinds of, of this kind of self-regulation is m most uh, uh, emphasized in uh, uh, agricultural societies where people must work together, closely together in small groups. They must inhibit their emotions. They must inhibit their impulses. They live in small settled communities. They can't allow for free play of impulses the way uh, foragers and pastoralists can who have much more room in, in a uh, in effect to escape. Um, this was uh, this this was demonstrated in a much cited study by uh, my co-author and longtime co uh, uh, collaborator Herb Barry, um, who uh, conducted this cross-cultural study of child training techniques and found this significant difference between uh, foragers and pastoralists on the one hand and um, agriculturalists, uh, horticulturalists, agriculturalists on the other in uh, pre-industrial, that is, traditional societies. The self-regulation of these high-risk takers requires the ability to assess risks and use emotionally motivated behavior like rage uh, strategically. It sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? Uh, to, to, um, to allow yourself. Um, but after all, when you think about it, a lot of the uh, we see it in our own society when, when, when people uh, are prepared to go, let's say soldiers are prepared to go into combat, or football teams are prepared to go out on the field and meet their uh, opponents. Uh, we see it in um, uh, uh, more traditional societies, especially before combat, these war dances. Um, even the most peaceful people have mechanisms for uh, inducing or uh, uh, increasing uh, rage and um, uh, uh, the desire to go out and, and beat them to a pulp, uh, whether literally or figuratively. So these techniques are there to, um, you might say, release uh, inhibitions and uh, promote impulsive behavior when it is beneficial. In other words, uh, use self-regulation <coughs> self and self, what I call half facetiously, deregulation as, um, as techniques. Uh, in societies in which some boys must take dangerous risks while others achieve success without doing so, there seems to be two conflicting kinds of socialization. <coughs> For high self-regulation by requiring strict, strict compliance with authorities, and for dangerous risk-taking by cer tolerating certain forms of aggressive behavior. We see this in the socialization patterns throughout European history. On the one hand, boys received early and strict training um, in their future occupations, whether these were manual labor, labor demanding cognitive skills, or the managerial and diplomatic work of the aristocrats and patricians. In other words, from a fairly early age, sometimes as early as eight or nine, but surely by adolescence, boys uh, particularly, well, girls were being trained in domestic skills, but boys were being trained for the particular occupational niche that they would follow, and discipline was often very strict because these, these young boys seemed to see, or as pages in the military, or or uh, given uh, responsibility for managing a herd, uh, uh, taking, taking a herd out to the field. Uh, these, kids, these kids had, had to uh, meet certain standards. On the other hand, and we're still speaking about uh, throughout European history, uh, 
boys were allowed to express their impulses through street brawls and attempts, and through attempts to seduce girls from vulnerable populations like the servant class. I mean, here was, you know, some areas where it was okay. It was okay to try to seduce the maid servant. It wasn't okay to try to seduce the uh, daughter of, a, uh, of an important person. Uh, a study in the flexibility of self-regulation is, is in Shakespeare's A Falstaff, where Prince Hal turns from a hell raiser to a sober monarch when he inherits the throne. So there's a certain amount of individual, uh, uh, you know, the, the ability to control or manage one's own level of self-regulation. Imperial China also had two socialization streams with different goals. One was to produce the genteel scholar gentleman, and the other was to produce the fearless aggressive warrior. Now, uh, China did not have primogeniture, so uh, the, these two kinds of socialization uh, patterns were not necessarily, um, uh, uh, did not necessarily follow birth order uh, as they did, say, throughout European history. Um, uh, so I know of no study that directly connects these two types uh, with birth order, but it is telling that many of the renowned conquerors and founders of dynasties came from poor peasant families where combat with its stimulation of aggressive impulses was the only means to a better life, even though its most likely outcome was death. Most uh, fomenters of rebellion ended up being executed, but those who succeeded ahead empires, uh, certainly nations, but then empires at their, at their hands. Um, we have looked at several factors involved in self-regulation within cultures. There's individual variation by temperament, and here genetic factors mo modified by epigenetic factors such as intrauterine environment or early childhood experience must be considered. There are also variations between demographic categories like gender, social rank, and class, and birth order. We have also considered differences in socialization or self-regulation across cultures with their different histories and environment. Now, an interesting question is whether there are population differences in uh, genetic features that may be related to self-regulation. Um, such as the differentially distributed serotonin transporter gene, and here I refer to an article by Chiao and Kaczynski, 2010, who asked the question whether a differential distribution of the serotonin transporter gene, um, uh, whether this dis distribution was selected for because of lesser or greater uh, need uh, for uh, self-regulation given the total environment conditions that would include culture, uh, social environment, of course, as well as natural environment. Uh, this is a subject for future research by geneticists. As far as I know, there's absolutely no consensus on that. Uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, quickly, uh, the cultural management of adolescent self-regulation. In addition to cultural practices that manage adolescent risk taking by attempting to direct it towards socially desired outcomes, there are those that attempt to do so by stopping as much as possible risk taking. An illustrative case of, of control is the treatment of adolescent Jewish boys in medieval and early modern Europe. Although there was variation among communities in between northern and southern Europe, Boys in these communities were generally highly restricted. Those whose parents could afford it were sent to religious schools, where they spent long hours studying under strict discipline. Those whose parents could not were sent into apprenticeships, where again, they were uh, strictly disciplined. Um, they were married at an early age, quite a bit younger than their Christian neighbors. Horowitz relates these customs to a desire to maintain discipline and discourage unmarried sexuality, but if, if that was the case, why wasn't it true for, for uh, their Christian neighbors? Um, it is not hard, however, to relate these uh, customs to the fear in these communities that any disruption would bring severe retaliation and all local Jews would suffer. 
It is if the Jewish boys got into street brawls with Christian boys, uh, for example, or a Jewish boy seduced a Christian girl, uh, this could bring down, um, bring, bring punishment down onto the whole community. The community dare not allow uh, this to happen. Uh, the boys were thus kept under strict rule and their sexual impulses satisfied by early marriage. Impulses may be directed toward what is considered to be social welfare in a sort of an odd way when adolescents are permitted to behave aggressively with the explicit or implicit permission of their elders. There are numerous cases of adults allowing and in fact enjoying the destruction of property, the insult to person, and the general tumult caused when adolescents harass adults who are seen as threats to the well-being of the community or the flouting of its moral standards. In other words, here's uh, adults using adolescents to serve their own ends and in doing so, uh, relaxing the, the, uh, uh, the, the self their self-regulation. Pygmy boys in the Congo were permitted to destroy the huts of those who defied the forest deities uh, by acting in unapproved ways. Boys in American Chinatown <coughs> were rewarded by dinners in local restaurants when they harassed and drove out prostitutes who might attract police into the community and attacked people who ran off without paying their restaurant bills. These are just some examples of adults using adolescents to do their social dirty work by giving them a lesson from self-regulation. In addition to these acts approved by the entire community, it is not unusual for families to tolerate or even encourage impulsive aggression by their children against vulnerable people or those defined as enemies. When Hopi children of a Ryabi village stole fruit from a certain man from another village who had married a local girl, his neighbors responded to his complaints by telling him that he did not belong there, and in other words, if he didn't like it, he should go back to his own village. He was not a particularly well-liked person, so uh, tolerating these, the theft and these impulsive acts on the part of the, the adolescents was uh, approved. For less destructive cases of tolerance of impulsive behavior, one need only think of the custom of European village boys and youths harassing inappropriately married couples, a custom called rough music in English, carivery in French, matinata in Italian, and katzenmusik in German. On the wedding night, the groups of adolescent boys and young bachelors would serenade the couple by shouting and bawling and banging on cans, at least until the groom came out and paid them off. So, <laughs> this would be, say, an older man marrying a young, a young girl, and one can certainly tie this to reproductive uh, issues by uh, uh, this is a complaint of these young unmarried, unmated males against the theft, so to speak, <laughs> of one of their potential brides by this older man who should stick to his own age. <laughs> Hopi adolescent boys who run the village after dark could spot a man sneaking over to a woman's house while her husband was away at his field camp. They, they would make a trail of sand uh, between the houses of an adulterous couple, providing much fodder for a clucking of tongues and a much relished malicious gossip the next morning. And I might say here parenthetically that adultery was one of the few forms of relief from the high degree of self-regulation demanded by Hopi culture. So it doesn't surprise me at all that we had a fairly high adultery rate. And in fact, this is uh, one way of perhaps looking at, at uh, those cultures with high adultery rates uh, might be uh, to consider whether um, whether this is not, uh, there are other reasons, of course, for, for adultery uh, uh, that come in many, reasons of many different types, but where there is a, a fairly high degree of adultery, and, or at least much concern with adultery, which are two different things, of course, um, one might ask whether this is not, at the same time as condemned, whether it's not also partially uh, enjoy not only by the couple themselves and of course by those who gossip about them, but whether it does not serve as a relief from intense uh, self-regulation. In other words, kind of a private carnival. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now, um, I've been talking principally 
about boys. Uh, I don't want to ignore girls, although um, certainly nothing in, in, in the cross-cultural study uh, pointed to any, any um, uh, to the same kind of variation in uh, antisocial behavior, which was generally implicit and quite often, often risk-taking, not always, but often risk-taking. Uh, but I would like to just mention that uh, it's generally true, uh, certainly in the cross-cultural research and in anything I've read about contemporary uh, life, that girls generally engage in fewer risky uh, acts than boys do, although here again, one question, is this because of a lower testosterone level? Is it because there's less opportunity? Is it because girls uh, in most societies are closer to their families and, and during adolescence than boys are, so it's not only that they're more under surveillance, but there's also a, less, uh, a, a lesser of an attenuation of a family attachment in girls than in boys, so that girls tend to be more with women than boys are with adult men, at least during their leisure hours. Um, there are probably multiple factors at work here. Females may be predisposed to take dangerous risks at a later stage in defense of their young, but so far I've heard relatively little about that in a discussion in evolutionary psychology. Uh, while physical aggression certainly exists among adolescent girls, competition generally takes non-physical forms of social dominance like um, verbal aggression, although uh, from all we know about the study of gender differences, it does seem that um, uh, there's less, um, that there, there tends to be more intimacy, emotional intimacy, among girls and among boys, but, but I don't want to go into that too much. Um, as cooperative breeders, human females rely heavily on cooperative social networks, and much research confirms the uh, emotional intimacy among females. Uh, these sex differences seem to be hardwired, but they may be modulated by cultural and individual circumstances. Uh, more benign forms of social dominance, which require a higher degree of self-regulation and possibly intelligence than physical or verbal aggression, are achieved through bestowing of gifts and favors and succeeding in valued activities. In my research on adolescent industrial apprentices in Germany, the all boys group, we had several groups, my sisters and I had several groups, but one of them consisted only of boys, um, established an order of dominance after just a few weeks, which persisted throughout the training period of two years. The rather loud assertive boy who attracted the most attention early on was soon supplanted by the most skilled and seemingly, to our, as far as we could judge, a most intelligent lad to whom others turned when they ran into difficulties. He was generous with his help and he never bragged or showed off his superior ability. And instead of resenting him, the other boys admired him and willingly gave him deference. So um, um, male-male competition can take more benign forms as well. As Ellis et al. have shown, the impulsive risk-taking of fast life history strategies is not necessarily pathological. Rather, it may be a high-stakes response to striving for, for, for social and ultimately reproductive success. The, de the risk of death or injury is balanced again against the possibility of gaining riches, even if these are this is false or fool's gold, such as money uh, gained through, say, drug, uh, drug trading, uh, land, possibly wives, or other desired goods. Uh, under some conditions, the environment favors high risk-taking. Under other conditions of greater environmental stability, low risk taking may be a better path. Uh, both kinds of temperaments, the, the impulsive and the highly self-regulated, were advantageous under different conditions, enough so that both kinds were maintained within the populations. And uh, uh, as uh, Wolf and Weising have pointed out, and I'm quoting here, uh, Non-equilibrium conditions have a high potential for maintaining variation, even in cases where equilibrium theory would predict the dominance of a single behavioral type. This plasticity, if we were, uh, uh, those of you who are in the evolutionary development reading group have been talking about. Okay, 
now. I just like to, to go over uh, very quickly what I talked about, and then, then I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, or engage in discussion. We see intercultural variation uh, by genetic and epigenetic uh, features which affect the individual as the individual. Uh, we see uh, variation by gender, by social class, by the type of setting, whether kids are with adults or, or, or less, uh, usually being in the presence of adults, same-sex adults anyway, uh, tends to promote self-regulation. But here again, that's assuming that the adults themselves are uh, self-regulating. Uh, Cross-cultural variation by system type and pastoral and foraging uh, as against agriculture. This is uh, seems to be. And then uh, environmental conditions and then historical traditions. And, and uh, 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 the environment of humans also includes something that that uh, other animal species do not have, uh, at least not to the same degree we do, and that is um, traditions, historical traditions. And I think we can look at this as a kind of a path dependency because after all, any in innovations that we make or any customs that we borrow from somebody else are in effect ratcheted onto. They either supplant something we've already got or they're ratcheted onto something that we've already got and um, uh, our high, highly developed cognitive capacity uh, makes this possible. So, so uh, when thinking about cross-cultural variation, we have to think about not only the uh, natural and the social environment uh, or and, uh, what people have to do in order to survive, uh, and that includes the whole spectrum of food getting predation, which can include other societies, of course. Uh, and we have to think in addition to historical traditions. And these affect the way cultures uh, evaluate, uh, define, evaluate, and manage uh, self-regulation and uh, in adults as well as adolescents. But of course, adolescence is a kind of a, a critical period when self-regulation it is, uh, I mean, you either get it or you don't uh, by that time, and it's difficult if you don't, it's difficult to reverse the, reverse the path. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so I have a two-part question. <clears throat> so first part, you talked about um, teaching self-regulation to sons based on kind of the inheritance pattern. So if it was the older child or the firstborn son that he'd be taught more self-regulation. If it was a later born son, he would be. Um, so first part of the question is, um, do those inheritance patterns, or the, the inheritance itself, itself, I guess, so the land, the animals, whatever's being inherited, does that correspond with actual social status within the community as well? Um, well, yeah, it, it can. Um, of course, there's no inheritance if there's nothing to inherit. Right. So that could be real property, or it could be um, it could be land or herds, or uh, it could also be non-material property like uh, a particular social rank. Okay. And um, uh, it's it's very interesting to look at the uh, at historical traditions in various parts of the world from from this point of view. Um, and sometimes these socialization patterns conflict. Now, I'm not saying that all firstborn sons were trained to be obedient and, you know, were highly self-regulated. All later-born sons were not. Obviously, there are different there are genetic epigenetic differences. Uh, there are uh, different differential responses to the immediate situation. And I think, that, but birth order certainly does come out in um, European societies and others that have. Uh, either primogeniture or ultimogeniture, and um, that's uh, I made the point that I I didn't see any connection, necessary connection with birth order in the little that I know about uh, 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 Chinese history, uh, but the, the Chinese did not have primogeniture. Um, they had, uh, in fact, there was a lot of competition among the sons. Or, um, inheritance of the father's position, or there was partible inheritance where each son was 
you're supposed to get the same amount. Uh, it, it gets it gets pretty complicated because uh, women's dowries get involved in the distribution of wealth to the next generation as well. So uh, a, a woman who brings in a, hot, a lot of dowry, her son may get the same division of the father's wealth as all of his half brothers, but his mother, his mother's dowry, a lot of that will go to him, and that will put him in a better economic position. But that's not dependent on birth order. And so one wouldn't expect to see the same kind of birth <coughs> order uh, behavior that one finds in um, uh, societies with either primogeniture or ultimogeniture. So I guess the second part of my question, and I'm sure that it would vary by society based on everything that you're just discussing, but um, if you could say that the inheritance would be um, you know, have some impact on the social status within the community. I'm wondering to what extent do you think that the differences in terms of risk taking, because that's what you were recently talking about, is that you know they would be taught more self-regulation, so they would engage in less risk taking. To what extent do you think that maybe that's really not due to self-regulation, but just due to the fact that, like you discuss, um, successful risk taking actually boosts social status, at least amongst your peer group, not necessarily amongst the society as a whole. But so that way, if you're already inheriting your social status, there's really no need to engage in any risky behavior because it's not going to do anything for you. Well, um, I couldn't exactly say this either because um, we have to think, it, it, it's not just culture, and it's not just birth order, it's not, <coughs> there will be um, uh, lower status boys, you know, younger sons, who are risk averse. And uh, there will be uh, firstborns who stand to inherit, who will be uh, uh, risk prone, or however you want to call it, for whatever reason. You know, there's there's a lot of ver uh, individual variability, uh, but certainly even in uh, even in small villages in Europe, I was amazed uh, to 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 go to one um, German village um, or Europe. This is true, I think quite generally in Europe, but this is one German village. Uh, uh, the son of a well-to-do peasant, the oldest son, inherited virtually everything. And his younger brothers got very little. And the next generation down, they would still recognize kinship, but there was a major status difference just, just between those brothers and their families. Yeah, and in fact, uh, there were even different parts of the cemetery. The high status people were buried in one part, and the lower status people were buried in another. And the, these were small towns, small villages, peasant villages, where where a lot of people were connected either through uh, ties of blood or ties of marriage. It makes a difference. So it makes a difference in how kids are socialized and, and what their expectations are and how um, how they're expected to behave. Among these Samoan uh, kids, um, uh, the big challenge for a boy is to seduce a taupu, a prince, so-called prince, when the prince is an elite girl, a daughter of a high-ranking family, uh, seduce one of uh, seduce that girl and persuade her to elope with him and join him in his village. And for this, he was praised by everyone in the village. And if it was a fait accompli, uh, her parents might disown her. But nevertheless, in that village into which she had been brought or, or lured, uh, seduced, uh, uh, her children would raise the status of the man then who became her husband. And because um, rank and uh, degree of purity, not, I wouldn't say purity, um, spiritual power was inherited through both parents. So if a lower ranking person uh, married a higher ranking person, their children would be raised above the lower ranking, couldn't achieve a higher ranking, but raised above the lower ranking. So marriage was a very strategic um, activity among these family, elite families, as it is everywhere where there are elites, and um, uh, or almost everywhere. And uh, so, um, so this affected how, how, boys, how boys were uh, were brought up. The elite
elite boys didn't have to, unless they, you know, they wanted to engage in fighting and trying to seduce girls and whatever. Maybe they just enjoyed that. But uh, it wasn't, didn't have the same, uh, same achievement value as it would for a lower status boy. Probably anticipated I would ask this question, but why do you think that self-regulation is necessarily a unique human capacity, especially if you remove the self out of it, um, which might be a human construct, a unique human construct, but just talk about behavioral regulation? Well, of course, here we're on very shaky ground, but uh, the kind of self-regulation that requires reflection and um, future goals, and that isn't only, you know, will I get that the next banana or will I be able to steal a banana from the gym around the corner. Um, the future goals, I think, requires a certain amount of cognitive capacity. Now, I could be wrong. So it's a degree, perhaps, of regulation. Well, yeah, and I, I, I don't like to make that much of a distinction mm -hmm. between self-regulation and self-monitoring, but I think it may be true that the higher you get on the, on the uh, evolutionary scale, the, at least among higher primates, uh, it tips a little bit more towards self-regulation. I'm not sure this, uh, you, you either have it or you don't. I mean, there's certainly I mean, even the most, the most unregulated person will self-regulate under certain conditions. So it's, it's not, not, you know, either or. And I don't know if that's true between species. I speculate that it is, but I, I wouldn't want to swear to it. I'm sort of struck as I, as I was listening to you about the mathematics the behavioral mathematics of self-regulation. Uh, in my field in behavioral psychology, uh, we use a matching law to describe um, behavioral frequencies. And Tom Deshawn, for example, has been able to predict um, that young people reinforcing one another in microbursts of, you know, well, I boosted a, a can of beer at the 7-Eleven, and the other kid says, well, I boosted a six-pack. Now predicts very large scale social behavior, but I'm also thinking about the matching law applying to, as, as the young people move, for example, into a condition of being with other non-familial adults, mm. because the matching law can work in a familial situation where the reinforcement is accidentally reinforcing escape behaviors, coercive behaviors, and so on, but if you're working with other adults, now that whole contingency system may have shifted. If you want to eat, you have to cooperate. So what I, what is going through my mind is, I don't know that anyone has actually done the sort of behavioral mathematics across the cultures to see the similarity of mathematical processes, which I, I'm sort of sitting here thinking have to be true, but I don't know that they're true. I mean, they're clearly true in Western culture. It's fascinating. I, well, all I can say is that um, that from you know many many observations which are provided the data for that book across many cultures, and from my own personal observation into modern societies, that is modern Germany and modern Italy, specifically the town of Siena. Uh, again. You know, I, this is something I'm not qualified to measure. I don't have the, 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 the methodological tools to measure it. But certainly from observation, it appeared to me that, um, well, both cultures, we know that both cultures provide mechanisms by which young people can become social apprentices of unrelated adults, and not just authority figures. I'm not talking about teachers, coaches, youth leaders. I'm talking about the general uh, community of adults or some segment of it uh, become the generalized mentors of these young people and these young people become social apprentices. And this is what I call an adult-centered uh, setting 
because the adults uh, usually are always outnumbered the adolescents. Whereas, say, school is a peer-centered setting because the peers outnumber the authority figures. And uh, there are two things going on here. You know, it's teacher versus student, and it's peer-peer. Well, in an adult-based setting, uh, the, the group of peers is small, and um, they have to conform to the adults, or they, you know, they'll be punished. They'll be, uh, 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 maybe even just by rejection or non-acceptance. And when you depend on adults uh, for resources at present and in the future, you're going to need some, you know, maybe your parents have to have to accept you, but nobody else does. So you have to behave in ways that they will accept you. Now, who are these people? Their future employers, their future uh, in-laws, uh, they're uh, people who can provide other kinds of resources like training and uh, in specific activities. So if, if uh, so, you're motivated to. Um, to self-regulate to whatever degree the culture, the culture demands. The follow on on that question is in the work that you're doing, and I, I don't know if there's a time period over sampling that you've seen, but it would seem, based on what you've said, is the degree to which modern culture, which is typically peer-centered rather than adult-centered, is migrating into these other cultures that you should see a degradation in self-measures of self-regulation. I can just imagine the sort of world sampling of using the Stroop test with a bunch of kids, and this would show rising levels of impulsivity, lack of self-regulatory uh, control as cross-cultural uh, phenomena. I mean, we're seeing it in some of the mental health. Well, I think you see it in Japan. I mean, uh, not not all kids, of course, but uh, Japan. In Japan, the adults show a high degree of self-regulation. Just the, the responses to this atomic uh, plant disaster show, and then we compare that to what happened. In with Katrina, I mean, there were many factors involved, but one of them was the way people, uh, uh, so in, in effect, self-regulated to um, uh, not to be aggressive or impulsive, but to to do whatever needed to be done and cooperate. Uh, but whether that's happening with the younger generation, I don't know. Um, of course, you can't always trust the media because nat naturally things will be exaggerated. But kids. Uh, boys spending hours in these these video game parlors and girls um, uh, well in some cases I've heard actually some girls uh, I don't even want to discuss it because I don't know you know I don't have the statistics but I I do think that that um, uh, that when there's a sharp transition yeah you know, sure then the, the controls come off. So I, I guess my interest in coming today actually was we've been trying to kick off a project of adolescent consumers, which we define as risky behavior. So from the standpoint that the risky behavior is adolescents engaging in hyper-consumerism, for example. You know, so it's really interesting to look at what you discussed today insofar as the resources for that deregulated or unregulated or permissive behavior come from the adults, which are the parents. But the peer group is the alliance, and it's also where the status affirming behavior or, or, or processes take place. So you know, you made this comment that adults use, in the cultural management piece, that adults use adolescents to do their social dirty work. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder you know, if you could speculate why it would be that parents would underwrite this rather unregulated behavior, what dirty work could these children be doing in the service of their parents, aside from the act of consuming having status implications for them as adults, but if we frame it that way, what might that say? And it's also a case where you would see, where at least data would indicate that girls are engaging more highly in this deviant behavior or risky behavior than boys, at least at that age. I'm not sure that I would <laughs> I, I, would, I would tie that more to adolescent socialization for adult consumerism. 
and it, 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 girls more than boys, it doesn't surprise me because who does most of the shopping for the household? not risky behavior, but rather socialization for sort of household consumption. So they're training them to be good managers of resources. Well, they're training them to be managers of resources, just like, you know, when you train somebody to drive, uh, that's a high risk situation, and you take them out to some place where they're not sure. going to hurt themselves or anybody else. And it may be that, that, this, that this is not so much risky behavior as, uh, as just imitating on a smaller scale what the parents are doing. Now, I, what would interest me is if uh, consumer spending seems to be down now, if adolescent consumer spending is also, it's up. As a general rule, it has increased. I mean, just recently. Well, the population of adolescent consumers is growing. Oh, okay. So well, they, they are now a much Canada. more viable and targeted consumer group. So. You know, I think that I think we just have to be careful about how we use the term risky. It's important to have a definition of risk. And the, you know, the definition that I like is that risky behaviors are behaviors that increase the variance in outcomes. So risky behaviors, by definition, have a large potential for loss mm -hmm. and a large potential for gain. Right. So they're dangerous, but they also can, can, can lead to returns. So among college students, you know, classic risky behavior is playing drinking games. Yeah. Playing drinking games are dangerous. Playing drinking games are often associated with fighting and drunk driving, but are also a very effective mechanism of obtaining sexual partners. Mm -hmm. So they have gains and they have losses. They're, they're classic, you know, risky behavior. So I don't know, when I think about you know, fi you know, I, I don't know. I mean, fi I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware of this work. Or, you know, trying to define spending, credit card use as risky behavior, and it is costly. You know, can be, but I think we just have to I don't know, define what we mean by. That's it. fair. I mean, can you actually yeah. classify it as such? And I guess that's the open question in terms yeah. of. Um, I, I think I would. My opinion would be to say no. It's not risky no, behavior. Sure. It's. It may be. Um, potentially harmful behavior, but I'm not sure that every harmful behavior is risky. I mean, overeating is, and eating, you know, consuming lots of sweets is harmful behavior, but I wouldn't call that high risk. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the, well, <laughs> what gauge and weight, yes. <laughs> 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 between strategic and impulsive risk-taking. Mm -hmm. uh, impulsive, and, and impulsive risk-taking, and I'm drawing on your work here, can be adaptive under these, these certain conditions, even though um, it is uh, potentially harmful to the individual and to the individual's offspring and to the larger community, but it can be, it can be, a, uh, it may be, you know, the only success. Um, and I'm not sure that everybody who follows a life history, well maybe this should be a discussion between us, but let me just say this, that everyone who follows a life history, fast life history strategy, is necessarily doing it non-strategically. Because you think of, of people, let's say, that drug dealers uh, who, who are very smart and set up real businesses, illegal businesses, and send out uh, teenagers to peddle their drugs. Um, are they strategic businessmen, or are they following a fast life history strategy? They may have lots of girlfriends, they may have a bunch of illegitimate children, but still they're, they're self-regulating in the sense that they, they pursue, they see certain goals with money, and they pursue it in a strategic way. I don't equate risky with impulsive. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would not equate risky with impulsive. I mean, it can be or no. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It can not. be impulsive or it can be strategic. <coughs> what I call strategic, where you're you're taking risks with full awareness of the possible consequences, and and and, and you've done some reflection on. 
means conscious reflection on the costs and the benefits. Are you aware of uh, when you were speaking of the pastoral cultures uh, when in encouraging the raiding and other uh, kinds of things? That may be one. I could think of an analogy or an analogous behaviors in the Southern culture of honor, where essentially young boys are actually encouraged much more extensively in the South to beat up and pick fights. Yeah, well, that's what Miss Ben and Colin were alluding to, yes. that they're, that, and they come from that particular part of the South, not the coastal belt, but Appalachia in particular. Yes. Yeah, come from these culture of honor uh, regions of the world, pastoral regions. Um, yeah. Um, Because culture, and I don't want to reify culture. Culture isn't a thing. Culture is a, is a, a modes of thinking about it and, and behaving. But um, cultures do do teach us how to perceive and interpret uh, various actions, and they uh, teach us should we should these enrage us or should they should we just you know cast them off. And, Boorish person who bumped into me doesn't, you know, any better. He, well, he just doesn't have any good manners. I'll ignore him. Or whether I should feel that he personally insulted me and I should, I should aggress. Um, teaches us, you know, what what behaviors are, how to interpret them, and then how to translate that interpretation into action. Or, and usually there are several possible actions one can take. I think if I just, if we just let it go, we're going to keep you here all night. <laughs> so I think what I want to do is uh, thank you for coming and speaking.